The University of Detroit Mercy presents another brand new episode of Ask the Professor, the radio show on which you match wits with the University of Detroit Mercy professors in an unrehearsed session of questions and answers. Today's program was recorded using Zoom video conferencing technology. The University Tower Chimes bring in another session of Ask the Professor, the show in which you match wits with the University of Detroit Mercy professors in an unrehearsed session of questions and answers. I'm your host, Matt Mayo, and let me introduce to you our panel for today. I'm doing everything I can to resist introducing Mara because she just took a big bite of a piece of fruit. So here is Professor Jim Tubbs. Hello. <laughs> How's How it going, you? Jim? Good, good. Excellent. And how are the skies over by you now? Well, they're clearing uh, slowly. Uh, it's still kind of dark, but not as dark as it was. And the thunder has quit. It was thundering a lot. The main thing that I was thinking when I saw this forecast was, you know, oh goody, like the fourth time that flash flooding will be called for in Metro Detroit this season. But climate change isn't real. So let's just. Oh, move right. On. Yeah. A hoax. No, it's just coincidence, you know, just yeah. happens. Just what we need, another underpass on 94 blocked for a whole week just because of water. Well, that yeah. very well may happen. Yep, it may. Going around the horn, we are visited in the lovely library of Professor Beth Oljar. Hey, good to be here. What's going on, Beth? No, I'm sitting in my lovely library, you know, hanging out. <laughs> just chilling, being somebody, you know. That sounds about right. That's pretty awesome. Yeah, you're always somebody. You're always somebody. Always. Technically true. Yeah. And maybe we'll be visited philosophically too. Yeah. Maybe yes, possibly me might make it since her bed is up here on my one end of my desk. We might get another visit from uh, the little monster. Got it. And I think Dave is just trying really, really hard to participate in the cat. I need a cat. I need a cat. Is that the Canadian Hello Kitty? <laughs> cats are great pets they're oh, incredibly self-sufficient <laughs> luckily your Talk drawings to the butt. don't translate very well to radio <laughs> thank goodness <laughs> uh professor dave chow if you haven't figured that out is also <laughs> with us today pleasure to be here as always <laughs> thanks for um reminding us how great that cats movie was from a couple years ago yeah thanks for that uh, yeah i'm gonna see that in the double feature of gili too okay <laughs> Festival uh, of the worst movies of all time. Well, they are back together, so you know. It must have been. Well, it's true. It's true. Dear Lord, um, I'm hoping that Professor Mar Livesey has made it uh, x number of uh, bites through her peach, and she's ready to be introduced. Absolutely. Hello. Is it a peach? It's a peach. My eyesight isn't as. I thought bad. it was a nectarine, but okay. Yep. Okay. I'm sorry, you can't see the fuzz. It looks peachy. <laughs> Buzz is what's on, missing, yeah. It's going great. I have some great news for all of y'all. Today, my youngest brother defended his PhD. So now, all three Livesey children can be called Dr. Livesey. Oh, wow, that's wow. impressive. What was his it. dissertation about? He talked all about the stabilization of epinephrine, which is the major uh, constituent of the EpiPen. Um, how to stabilize it with some type of metal complex. It's cool Ooh, stuff. That's intense. It, it was Big intense. Deal. Wow. Are, and all of you are in the sciences and some, all of your PhDs are in the sciences or? If you can believe it, older brothers in physics, I'm biochem. Youngest brother is technically chemistry, but inorganic. So no, no. Which one of these is the, the, the goose guy that I drew the, is this the guy? No, it's my older brother. Okay, I okay, wasn't sure. <laughs> Unbelievable. So you're the middle child in between two brothers. That must have been interesting and fun growing up. Great, actually. Yeah, if it were a younger and older sister, it would have been different. You know, Marsha, Marsha, Marsha. It's always about <laughs> Marsha. Mm -hmm. Having Mara, older Mara, sisters, Mara. I can testify that that is true. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Marsha, course, Marsha, Marsha. Those are the dulcet tones of uh, Associate Librarian Chris McClanus, who's joined us here today as a guest panelist. Thanks for coming, Chris. Oh, my pleasure. Happy to be here. Yeah. 
So we've got uh, all sorts of fun things we're going to do on the show, but maybe you can um, sort of give us a sense. Uh, you know, we didn't do this on the last show because we didn't have the bandwidth, but maybe now we do. Uh, let us know a little bit about you here. How long have you been at, at Detroit Mercy now, Chris? I have actually been at Detroit Mercy since I was a student in the 80s. Um, I became a student assistant in 1981 at the library, first in the stacks, then at the circulation desk. 1984 became a full-time circulation assistant. 1991 became a cataloging technician. Then 1995, right after I finished my library science degree, I was hired in as a librarian. And yeah, over half my life. It is wow. daunting to think about. What a mm. sentence. Oh, I mean, what, what a career. <laughs> Thank you. It's like Matt. Yeah. I mean, you were a student and then came to, I mean, how, how you made that happen, I'm not quite sure, but. Not, neither can I, but Chris's numbers definitely um, outshine mine. And frankly, I think she's being a little modest because everybody at Detroit Mercy, who's anybody, uh, knows that Chris is a union stalwart for the UDMPU. Indeed. And we thank you for your many, many decades of service, Chris. Indeed. You're very welcome. Excellent. Glad to be part of that. But of course, not all of our listeners know that you, Matt, as an alum, is also the author of our alma mater. That, that is true. However, a lot of those things haven't happened in a long time <laughs> or haven't had the chance of happening in a long time. So th there's another wish for this uh, upcoming year that we might be able to go to a few basketball games and, you know, soccer games and things like that. That would be nice. But hey, folks, this is a program where you send us questions regarding anything. If you stump the panel, you win a prize. If you don't stump the panel, you win a prize. You can send us the questions in a number of ways. Email us at atp at udmercy.edu. Find us on Facebook or Instagram, or listen on your favorite smart speaker by asking it to play Ask the Professor at University of Detroit Mercy. Oh, my, oh, my. Look at this. Uh -oh. Dear panelists. Silly me here, nearly forgot to send you our family's latest round of questions for your fine show. So before I retire for the evening, here are 25 questions to keep your show cooking right along. We hope you'll have as much fun with them as we have crafting them for you. Warmest greetings from Valencia, California. It's our friend and his family, Frank Burroughs. Thanks hey, Frank. Hey. I'm not seeing any theme in that paragraph. So unless uh -oh. there's something secret about let's get cooking. So let's see what we can do with these. I uh, was wondering if they were going to be about cooking. If the questions are going to be about cooking, that would be really cool. Oh, I'm hungry too. Right. He was born Reginald Kenneth Dwight, but we know him better as Elton John. When he changed his name to Elton John, what did he choose for his middle name? He's got a middle name? He does. And he didn't and just keep way, Dwight. No, Balfour, no. maybe. Come on, um, but come on, it, Jim. I know you influenced him. Oh, we have to be careful to remember he is Sir Elton John. Now, oh, so. right. True. Elton. Same as the most famous um, of the ancient Greek demigods. Zeus. Apollo. No, wrong. Mercury. Nope. So demigod is this would be like a uh, god oh. and a mortal, child of a god and a mortal. Oh, um, Hercules. Hercules. Yeah, Her Mara hit it. Hercules. 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 Elton Hercules John. Yep, sir. It's a great Elton. movie. Sir Elton. Wow. Yeah, pretty cool. Okay. Um, what state would you find quote the city too busy to hate unquote? Oh, it sounds like it's got to be in Minnesota. It, it it does, but once you find out what it is, it's going to take a little bit of a different meaning. <laughs> Jim, this sounds like it's in your neck of the woods. No, it's like, no, it's not, I think it's not it's, a Carolina. Isn't it like um, St. Louis? Um, no. City no. Too busy to hate. Is it Midwest? No, no. You do know if we were back in the studio, we'd be looking up at the map right about now. <laughs> yeah. No, that's true. New York. I had forgotten about that map. It's not New York. Chicago. No, you know, um, no. the best hint I can give you if your Olympic memory is good would have been Summer Olympics 1996. Atlanta. Atlanta. Atlanta, Georgia is the city too busy to hate. 
Yes. Um, it wasn't going to be Clawson, so. No, and it wasn't Kigo Harbor either. Oh, darn. Exactly. So, uh, I remember that Olympics because I defended my dissertation and came home and watched the opening ceremonies of that uh, Olympic Games. Uh, and then the U.S. women took the gold medal. So right. that was really cool, too. Right. Uh, oddly, the first thing that jumps into my mind, so please forgive me, is the... Um, the, Richard Bombing. the bomber, bomber. Yeah, yeah exactly so it wasn't richard jewel I just want to go on record we we went we did that in court uh, what company produces the greatest number of wristwatches seiko timex um fossil greatest fossil. number casio it is. It's Casio, Jim. Yeah. I was about to say, uh, think 1980s calculator watches, and then you'd be oh, there. But Casio. yeah, I mean, isn't isn't Casio like famous for like making little kids watches as opposed to like adult watches? Well, they're sort of rubberized, you know. Yeah, they're... yeah, that's true. That's true. They're digital. Yep. What soft drinks uh, mascot? Let's just call it like it is. It's Pop. What Pop's mascot is named Woody? Verner's the gnome. Yeah, it is Verner's. The Verner's okay. gnome is Woody the gnome. What do you think? Hmm, he's cool. I could deal with cool. it. <laughs> Never heard of Verner's till I moved here. So it's I okay. didn't know that any pop had a mascot. So yeah. it's all new. And of course, you know that Verner's is considered a medicinal pop, right up there with Coca Cola. Mm -hmm. Right. That's Speaking of medicinal, right. did you hear that Mountain Dew is going alcoholic? <gasps> It's going to be it's going to be available in three flavors original um i forget one of them was like raspberry or cherry or strawberry maybe Ooh. and they're going to be five percent alcohol well it'll probably be like mike's hard lemonade and those are really good i actually like those a lot so mexico is branching out yeah I'm you know really... has caffeine so it's pro they're probably trying right. to with monster drinks also yeah yeah that's... Stop them. here i come with... I think oh. we didn't learn our lesson with Four Loco. <laughs> I knew that was going to come up too. Because I got to be honest, I just got back from vacation with my uh, in-laws and my 20s aged uh, nephews are there and they're they're doing White Claw a lot. And I'm like, guys, is there something I don't understand? They're yeah, like, come on. Yes, a lot. Your, your uncle survived Zima, you know? I mean, come on, get over it. Seriously. seriously. Wow. And Bartles and James wine coolers. Oh, oh yes. <laughs> They're wet and they're dry. Thank Which you was, for your see, support. I, I never figured out the attraction of Jägermeister. I just oh couldn't my. figure it out. That's a different story. Ugh. Ugh. Uh, professors, which U.S. president was the first to wear contacts while they were president? Carter? Mm -mm. Clinton? Nixon? No. JFK? Uh, Obama? It's... Fairly modern era, but I just haven't heard his name yet. Bush? Reagan? It was Reagan is what it says here. Reagan was the first to wear contacts. Yeah. Oh, well, he was an actor. I, mean, I was, was just thinking, was, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay, all right. Maybe bothered to wear eyeglasses, right? Harms' look. <laughs> wow, here's something I've been missing during the pandemic, and I know I brought this up before, and you all make fun of me, but I don't care. <laughs> Who was the reality show Survivor's first season winner? Somebody named Richard. Oh, yeah. Hatch. Richard that, Hatch, wasn't it? Oh, yeah, Richard Hatch. Yeah. Yeah, it was Richard Hatch. That was his name. Wasn't that also the same name as the guy that played Apollo on Battlestar Galactica? Yeah, there was an yeah. actor. She's going to say there was an actor of that name that I recall. Okay. Wow. All I'm saying is um, they, they, of course, even if they were remote and on an island or whatever it is that they do, they, they did not record for the last year and a half. So um, mm. for the first time ever since the year 2000, doing two seasons a year. So season 42 coming up very soon of Survivor. Pretty. Amazing. I played the board game version of Survivor and Drew voted me off the island. So. <laughs> oh. That's wow. Well, he said you were the biggest threat. So I'm like, yeah. okay. Makes you feel good. No, I mean, do you remember the old TV show Missing Link? Oh, you know, yeah. they kind, of, kind of go around. Yeah, you know, there's usually three contestants left and they always vote off the smartest one. You know, when it comes down, you know, because you want the least competition. It's fair. Let's take it as a compliment, Beth. I thought it was a pretty good save. So yeah. you tolerate them. Professors, what Australian band released the album titled Business as Usual 
in nice men at work. Mm -hmm. Men at work, absolutely. In what body of water do you find the Belcher Islands? B E L C H E R. They should be near Australia, but probably. Actually, to be honest, relatively speaking, they're pretty close to where we are. Oh, Uh, the Detroit River. A little bit further, Chris. A little bit further. One of the Great Lakes? Um, Nope. Oh. Uh, Lake St. Clair. Water. No. (laughs) Um. Or Lake Erie for going further south. I know. Well, there are a process of elimination. Okay. I don't so think they're, is, in, they're not in Washington. Nope. What's the largest body of water that's not a Lake Superior close to where we are right now? Lake Michigan? Nope. I'm looking for uh, Hudson Bay is actually where it is. Oh, oh Hudson, Hudson Bay. Bay. Uh, great, great store. Lake. Yeah, exactly. I would have said West Point. That would have been a help, but... Mm, okay. Sorry. Sorry. Can you name... At least two of the four Detroit Tigers minor league affiliates: Lakeland, Toledo Mudhens, Toledo Mudhens, West Michigan. Yep, West Michigan Whitecaps. And, and uh, Jim actually said Lakeland, or somebody did the Flying did. Tigers. The only one you haven't mentioned um, are the Erie Sea Wolves. Erie, yeah, okay. Oh. Very well done. And I was trying to explain to my son the other day, no, the more A's, the higher the level of that team, the less A's, the lower the level. And they're like looking at me like, why didn't they just use numbers? This is dumb. Yeah. (laughs) Their logic is, you know, sensible to me. So Uh, who is the only U.S. president who got married in a ceremony that took place in the White House? Wilson. It's not what it says here. Forever Cleveland. It says it's Cleveland. Yeah. yeah. I wonder, um, Beth, if that marriage might have taken place. I don't know. They're getting out on a technicality, like on the grounds or something. But he may, they may not have been married in the, mm. in the White House, but I think he, he married her while he was president, right? He did, but I'm sure he got married in a church. Mm. Yeah. Well, a whites only church, no doubt. Yeah. <laughs> Bingo. <laughs> Hey, uh, you only have uh, four choices, so it's perfect for multiple choice. Which of the Beatles was the shortest at 5'8"? Ringo. Ringo. Says it was Ringo, yeah. All the rest of the Beatles were exactly 5'11". Okay, that's kind of weird. That is weird. They would have made a great rowing team. Okay, now how tall is Pete Best? Oh, well, that's a completely different story. Oh, darn. I was hoping, I was hoping there would be a follow-up. No, nope, I don't think. Unless you call this question a follow-up. What oh. country that only makes up 4% of the world's population buys 20% of the world's toilet paper? Us. It's the United States. Yeah. Good old Gotta get on that old. bidet train. <laughs> I didn't I didn't know there's a train for it. Oh my god. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> How about uh, this one uh, semi related to our good friends at the Detroit Zoo? What animal at American zoos has been most likely to injure its handlers? Hippos. St- I mean hippos are pretty nasty to humans, right? Uh, Jim, but it doesn't say that here. I think the the humans are keeping their distance. Wait a minute. Is this a follow-up to like the Joe Mendy questions we used to get math? I mean, is it chimpanzees? Oh, I can I can tell you this. It's not chimpanzee, but I oh. know for a fact the Detroit Zoo has this animal on display. Ooh. Is it a bear or not a big a cat? No. Not one of the big cats? Nope. Elephant? Not an elephant. Penguins. No. Those penguins. nasty little creatures. <laughs> <laughs> hey, mom. Same color scheme as those penguins? Black huh. pandas? No, we don't have pandas. What am I thinking? Uh, black and white? What? What is black zebra. and white do? That's the zebras. What? The zebras <laughs> have uh, injured more handlers in the history of American zoos than any other animal. That's oh, crazy. is that saying something about the handlers or the animals? I mean, but they're just horses that are painted with stripes, right? 
it well, sounds Beth like my uh, I know there's an internet meme about this, but we pretty much do it every other night at the Mayo house because the only vegetables my boys will eat reliably are broccoli and cauliflower. And they refer to cauliflower as ghost broccoli. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like you're not like you're not far that. off, but uh, yeah, that's cool. Yeah, ghost broccoli. Who said a very very famous um, recently passed away um, celebrity who loved to come and especially eat in Detroit? Who said your body's not a temple? It's an amusement park. We should enjoy the ride. Well, Anthony Bourdain, cinnamon. Yeah, it's Anthony Bourdain. My beloved Boston. Anthony Bourdain. Yep. Poor Anthony Bourdain. We miss him. Yeah, it's kind of sad. Let's see if we can, uh, um, you know, switch gears here. According to the Guinness Book of World Records, there is a very, very famous person. I think he's still alive. If he is, he's in his 90s. He amassed the world's largest collection of personal scrapbooks. I remember hearing about this, your other hint. We'll go towards Professor Livesey because this person is intimately tied to his alma mater, the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Who is this person? Prasad Vanugapal. No. No? Uh, This person collected a world's record 2,396 personal scrapbooks. Wait a minute, it's Chris. Chris did it (laughs) for for UDM, right? I'm on the line, I alums. You guys got to... I'm not sure I'm old enough, right? Yeah. (laughs) Come on, Chris. I I, I know you have a section in the back of the library with all your scrapbooks. I know you do. Don't hold out on it. Roger (laughs) Adams? No, no, but that's a good guess. No, this is actually a um, sort of a pop culture icon because the other thing he gifted to the great university that was his alma mater was a, a mint condition issue of every one of the magazines that he published. Not Elmore Leonard. Mm-mm. Magazine published. So this would be like a fine magazine or? <laughs> well, no, if I tell you the magazine. Chris, Playboy? Yes, there we go. Oh, oh, you have her? You have her, yes. Oh, I didn't know that. I didn't know yes. he was into scrapbooks. Huh. That's, that's kind of creepy. I, that's I can't make you wonder about the pictures in those scrapbooks. <laughs> I, can't, I can't imagine seeing him at Michael's picking up like pinking shears or anything like that. I've never been more proud to be <laughs> an alum. Careful, Mara. You can you can find out one of the scrapbooks you're in there, and then oh, Mara and Hugh. Mm-hmm. Oh, Woo! <laughs> what university has Tim the Beaver as its mascot? And uh, this university brags about the fact that it has a mascot, but exactly zero sports teams. Well, it can't be University of Oregon or uh, Oregon State University. Okay. Then. Was... Hmm. But they are the Beavers, so. Yeah, it's true. It's true. Um, what, what, like DeVry or somebody like that? <laughs> no, it's, it's actually a very, very well known and high level R1 university, but they pride themselves on the fact that they'd rather be busy as beavers than playing sports. That's the key. What? MIT, Princeton? Yeah, it's MIT. Yeah, uh, MIT. Mm-hmm. Okay. I know I knew it wasn't going to be CCS. So, I mean, <laughs> huh. This 1984 Detroit Tiger player was once the roommate to a famous wrestler, Randy Savage, of all people. Who was he? Oh, I love this um, trivia. was it Chet Lemon? No, no. Close, um, though. Oh, crap. Who else, who else was in the outfield with him? Uh, initials L.H. Larry Herndon. Larry Herndon. <laughs> I just love stories like that. Oh my! Randy gosh. Savage and Larry Herndon and the oh god, yeah, that's pretty incredible. What, what, does it say what alma mater they went to? No, actually, it doesn't have oh, that darn. detail. But I'm taking this bit of trivia to my grave. Um, you know, there was a great piece in the uh, Detroit Free Press over the weekend about Chet Lemon because you brought up Chet Lemon and uh, the infamous. Um, he really wanted to get to first, so he actually slid into first, and how Sparky Anderson never let him live it down. That was actually a really cute story. I, I love the fact that he also had that glove since he was a little kid, too. Mm-hmm. That glove was like paper mache by the time he got to the bigs. I mean, it's hilarious. Oh, my gosh. Now, um, Frank and his family have done something pretty incredible here. I'm just trying to be mindful of the time. They have a list of the world's 20 most populous cities, and they want us to name any 12. So what I'm going to do... <laughs> Is I'm going to shave that down just a little bit. 
and see if on the first try we can get any one of the top five most populous cities in the world. Tokyo. Beijing. Um, Neither of those are in the top five of the world's most populous cities. Shanghai? Incorrect. Oh. New Delhi, someplace in India, right? Apollo. There is no Indian city in the top five. What? Yeah, Brazil would be my next guess, right? Someplace. Sao Paulo. Sao Paulo. Not Sao Paulo, but Rio. 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 Okay. Rio de Janeiro, Brazil is the world's most populous city with over 13 million. And just to be clear, city hmm. proper. So oh. the suburbs add to that, right? So oh. it's incredible. But uh, the remaining list in the top five is Tianjin, China, Manila in the Philippines, Kinsha, which is in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, and Lagos is as a very healthy, over 14 million people in Nigeria. Incredible. Absolutely. Good grief. So the city itself must be tiny and the burbs are like insane then. Right. I think that that's sort of the uh, um, uh, attitude here. Uh, Frank adds, by the way, oh my gosh, what have I done? What have you done? Nope, I've done a horrible, horrible thing by not flipping the page. <laughs> oh! So yeah, you guys got it all completely correct. <laughs> and you got it in the order that it was presented here. So you're all way, way smarter than me. What am I thinking? Tokyo, Japan, 37.4 million city proper. Okay, okay. Mm. Wow. Ooh, okay. Delhi, India, 30.2 uh, million. Shanghai, 27.1 million. Sao Paulo, 22. I mean, you literally got it in the order that it's presented. Okay. Nice. Wow. And, and something was weird. Jeez, because was like, so don't oh, make us feel so dumb, dumb, Matt. Yeah. We already do. <laughs> uh, but the uh, follow-up trivia, which will hopefully uh, erase uh, my hor horrific error, is where does Detroit come in on the world's most populous city list? We're way down. Oh, what number? 415. 975. <laughs> Oh, I, I think 43. I got it. 837th. 837th. Oh, 837th. Yeah. Uh, very, very sorry about the... Uh, um, On our way up. Those were the, the bottom five of the top 20. There we go. Okay. Who, uh, which celebrity holds the single day winnings record on Celebrity Jeopardy? leaving the show after one play of $68,000. That's a pretty healthy haul for Jeopardy. Hmm. Celebrity Jeopardy, huh? Like yep. Anderson Cooper? No, that's a good guess, but this is a um, mostly what? 90s era comedian. Uh, comedian? Initials... Dave Chappelle? No, that's a good yeah. guess. The initials are A-R. Andy Richter. Andy Richter. There we go. $68,000. Wow. <laughs> wow. I always have this theory on Celebrity Jeopardy. The questions always seem to be about two or three steps more straightforward <laughs> than regular Jeopardy. I don't know if anybody's been watching recently, but all sorts of interesting controversy surrounding who the uh, permanent host is going to be going forward. Did you see who they chose? Yeah, and then they rebooted it again because, of course, people have skeletons in their closet that they didn't. No, no, I, I heard today that you know Mike Richards is chosen, and Mia By was it Bylik? Is that right. she's doing a, a spinoff? Right, right. There's going oh. to be a um, syndicated Jeopardy for like the college tournament that actually will appear on on different channels, so they can. Uh, but have Matt Jeopardy has on. a thing against her. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if, if all of you have been watching all of them. Some have been better than others. LeVar Burton was actually a, a freaking joy to watch host. He was just sort of like so excited. He, he was so happy to host. be there. Yeah. Yep. But there I were other people him. like Mehmet Oz that I was just sort of like, let's just not yeah. watch that week. You know? I thought my and B. Alec did a good job. Yeah. On there. Matt doesn't like her because she says, why, why is it that you don't like her? She falsely claims to have a doctorate in chemistry. Is that it? She has a degree neuroscience. In, in, yeah, neuroscience, but she asked to be referred to as Dr. Mayim Bialik, but she's not technically a practicing scientist. Mm. So I'm just did she just get a PhD? Does she have a PhD? She has a PhD. She's just not 
practicing as a scientist. Okay, well, if she has a PhD, she gets the doctor. Yeah, you know, and I understand that it's a touchy subject. I'm just getting a little bit of a Dr. Laura vibe is the point that I'm oh, trying to make. Oh, You know what I mean? Fair Ooh. enough. Like, yeah. I don't think there are too many other comparisons to be made there between her and Dr. Laura. You no, know, no. No, as far as I know, they both are people, but we can just sort of leave yeah. it. <laughs> Bipedal. One more question before we have to uh, slam dunk the end to uh, me screwing up this giant list that started on one page and ended on another. <laughs> Who are collectively Richard Bachman, Mary Westmacott, and Paul French? Well, Richard Bachman is Stephen King. So that's a good lead. Sure. The- Mystery writers? I mean, are, they're, they are, are writers, writers pseudonym. So who is Mary Westmacott? Mary Westmacott. Like J.K. Rowling? Nope. A Anne little Rice? bit before then, even before Anne Rice. Wait, but these are all the names that Jason Roach goes under, you know, in his no-tell motel days, right? <laughs> no, Mary Westmacott was Agatha Christie's uh, uh, pseudonym. Oh, uh, okay. Okay. And uh, I think I think I've learned something about uh, most of you just by the fact that you didn't recognize Paul French. That was um, Isaac Asimov when he uh, started. Oh. Oh, okay. name. Yes. The French uh, party of two. Gotcha. Yes. Uh, even though I screwed up your a list of populous cities here, um, Frank and family, thank you very much for sending those in. That was pretty awesome. We are uh, really excited to be uh, folks who can hear my voice finishing up our uh, year 21 season. And this actually will be our last episode. So that's pretty uh, amazing. And we are planning to continue to bring you great content into the 22 season, which will start uh, at the beginning of September. We're going to start bringing good content for once. When did that, yeah, ha- when did yeah, that happen? That's the plan. The plan we is- took a oh. vote without you, Dave, and we decided oh. we wanted to go with some good content. So I'm being voted off the island again, right? Yeah, right, right. Mara and I are now in charge. <laughs> uh, but yeah, prof, profs, I'm afraid the time has come for us to say goodbye, Mara. Toodaloo. Dave. Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go back to my nap now. <laughs> Jim. Jim. Goodbye. Oh, thanks. <laughs> and Chris. Farewell. (laughs) Now these words from University of Detroit Mercy. Ask the Professor is transcribed in, you know, all of our homes, but usually it's in the Briggs Building in the Department of Communication Studies in the College of Liberal Arts and Education at University of Detroit Mercy's McNichols Campus. Ask the Professor is produced and technically directed by Michael Jason and Brian Masonville, and our executive producer is Professor Jason Roach. Until next week, I'm your host, Matt Mayo.